bring this uh, meeting of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee to order. Thank you to uh, the members and the testifiers. Um, so today we'll be doing industry overviews and hearing from the various uh, significant Minnesota industries that interact with this committee and with this uh, legislative body uh, and uh, learning from them about their uh, relations with us. Uh, and we will also be hearing from the Office of the Attorney General and uh, Keith, Attorney General Keith Ellison about his work in the consumer protection realm. Uh, Attorney General Ellison is on a tight schedule so that when he does come in the room, we're going to interrupt the agenda where we are uh, and give him a chance to present himself. Uh, he's told us he has an ETA of about 1.30, so I, I actually think it'll probably work out just about right. So, um, And with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and bring uh, our first witnesses to the table, and that will be... Uh, Joe Witt and Teresa Kuvas from the Minnesota Bakers Association. Good morning and welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourselves for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Yeah, Mr. Chair, my name is Joe Witt. I'm president and CEO of the Minnesota Bankers Association. I'm Teresa Kuvas with the Minnesota Bankers Association. Thank you very much for this opportunity. There is a little packet in your, or excuse me, a little handout in your packet if you're interested in following along. Um, wanted to tell you just a couple things about our trade group and then launch into our industry uh, overview. Uh, the MBA is the state's largest banking trade group. We represent about 95% of the banks in Minnesota. Um, like any association, we focus on improving the general environment for our our banks that we represent. Um, we do a lot of education programming and provide a lot of other resources. Um, one of the things that um, we're very proud of at our association is that we have um, four attorneys on staff um, who help our member banks with legal and compliance issues. And also our attorneys are very active and involved in our legislative process. So um, our general counsel is Tess Rice. She wasn't able to be here today, so I'm pinch hitting. Um, but if you ever have any issues that pop up um, banking related with your constituents, um, please feel free to reach out to Teresa and Tess. Um, and we'll do the best we can to make sure you get a chance to address those issues. Um, turning to the industry, Minnesota has 316 uh, separately chartered banks that are operating in Minnesota um, that have an official branch here. Of that 316, um, 263 of them are chartered here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the other 53 are chartered in a different state, but they have official branches here. Most of those are uh, community banks that are operating in our neighboring states. You might have a bank that's headquartered in Wisconsin that has um, its main location in Superior, um, and then they put a branch into Duluth. Or same situation, a bank from North Dakota might have a Fargo location and they decide to branch into Minnesota into Moorhead. Um, in also covered in that group of 53 banks that are operating here but are chartered somewhere else are all of the big banks. U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, Associated Bank, um, BMO Harris, uh, Huntington, the former TCF bank, um, all of those institutions are operating here in Minnesota, as you know. Um, they just happen to be headquartered somewhere else. Um, the, so question, you know, Minnesota has 263 banks. Where does that rank in the U.S.? Is that typical? Not really. We actually have the third most banks in the country. Um, Texas has the most with 392, Illinois is second with 381, we're third with 263, and then Iowa is fourth with 253. Um, even though we have the most uh, banks, or third most banks in the country, our numbers are dropping every year. I put a chart in your packet. Um, in the year 2000, we had 513 separately chartered Minnesota banks. And as I said, we're down to 263 now, so that number's been almost cut in half since the year 2000. Um, why is that happening? There's a couple main reasons that a bank would decide to, uh, a bank owners would decide to sell and merge into another organization. One of the main ones is the cost of new regulations that have come down over the last 20 years. Almost all of them are federal rules. Um, I'm not trying to lay the blame on the state of Minnesota. Um, you guys have done a great job of making sure that our banks are well regulated, but not dumping a lot of new rules and regulations on us, so we really appreciate that. Second thing that's really driving the mergers is the cost of technology. Um, the cost of protecting uh, our customers' data, the cost of, pr of protecting our systems from cyber attacks and ransomware. Um, 
those two things are now fixed costs um, that all banks have to shoulder. And whenever you have fixed costs, you need to get some economies of scale. And sometimes the smallest banks are having a hard time doing that. So we're seeing a lot of them exit the, uh, exit the marketplace. All the, in all of the cases where that's happened, the bank has been sold and merged into another one. So you might still have banking locations that are out there. You just don't have separately chartered banks anymore. Um, there's gonna be a lot of regulated entities that come before your groups, but even among the regulated entities, um, banking is, is considered very highly regulated. Um, every single quarter, we have to report on our conditions uh, to our examining agencies. There's a, it's about an 80-page report that we fill out, listing all the different types of loans we have, how many loans that we have that are delinquent, all those types of things that let the regulators know where we're at. The other thing that separates us is, is um, extensive on-site examinations. Um, there's a lot of groups, even within the financial services sector, that have to comply with lots of different laws and regulations, but not all of them have on-site examinations the way we do. Um, so for example, like mortgage brokers, they have a lot of rules they have to comply with within the mortgage industry, but they don't have on-site exams like we do. So looking at um, bank regulation in more, more detail, um, who is involved in that process? Um, we have what's called a dual banking system. Banks can either be chartered at the state level by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, or they can be chartered as a federal institution. And then they would be regulated by the OCC, the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Numbers wise, 21% of the banks in the country are national banks, and 79% of the banks in the country are state chartered banks. Most of the very big banks are national banks. One of the advantages that they say national banks have is that there's just one set of rules. You don't have to worry about 50 di different sets of rules if you're gonna operate in all 50 states. So while there are fewer national banks, by and large, they're also you know, the bigger ones. State chartered banks are examined by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, as I said, plus they also have a federal regulator, either the FDIC or the Fed, depending on their exact charter. And they do the exams alternating, so the state of Minnesota will come in one time, then 18 months later when it's time for the next exam, then the feds would come in, and then it would rotate back to the Department of Commerce. Banks over 10 billion in assets are also examined by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to make sure they're complying with all of the um, consumer rules. It, banks under 10 billion and less are just regulated by their, their regular examiner for consumer compliance. Bank holding companies are also examined by the Federal Reserve. So looking at the different types of bank exams that there are, um, when we talk about those on-site exams, there's four different components to them. There's a safety and soundness exam, which um, tests whether banks are in good financial shape. The, the tests they run there are what's called the CAMELS test, capital adequacy, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity to market risk. Right now, the banks are in great uh, health. Um, there's only a couple banks on the regulator's watch list that they're taking a look at. The second type of exams, as I mentioned, are compliance exams, making sure that they're complying with all the rules and regulation that protect consumers. Information technology, I kind of mentioned that one as well, and then the bank holding companies. I put in a slide that has all the federal consumer protection laws and regulations. There's a big, long list. Um, this is a major area, that, again, that has exploded over the last several years. There's lots and lots of rules that results in lots and lots of paper. If you open up a checking account now or, or, you, or you apply for a loan, there's all kinds of paper you get. Um, and that's why it takes so long to open up those accounts. For example, if you look at a mortgage situation, there's really only two documents that you have to sign that the banks need. The first one is the loan, the promissory note you promise to pay. And the second one is the mortgage that gives the bank a lien on your property. Other than those two forms, that whole thick packet you have to sign and initial all the time, pretty much everything else but that is, is, is government required. Mostly federal, a couple state rules, and even some local rules uh, that go into a mortgage pile, but mostly, as I said, it's mostly government docs. In addition to advocating for our banks, we look for ways that um, banks can help their customers and communities. A couple years ago, we passed a 
well, yeah, a couple of years ago, we passed a senior financial fraud bill that was designed to protect seniors and other vulnerable adults. We were very proud to spearhead that if that uh, particular effort and um, are, have been really pleased with the results. That, that law that, that you guys passed is working and it is protecting seniors. We're very proud to have played our part in that. Another example that we're working on a lot right now is trying to work with the, the unbanked and the underbanked. And again, we've, we've passed some leg legislation that was just designed to help in that area as well. It's something we care about very deeply. Um, that's all the prepared remarks I have. Again, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak with you here today. At the end of the presentation that we handed out, it does have Teresa's phone number as well as Tess's phone number. Again, if there's anything that we can help you with, we, we would love to do that. I'd just leave you with this thought. Banks are good employers. Um, they, in a lot of our communities, the, uh, the job at a bank is a good stable job for folks. They pay good salaries, they have good benefits. Um, and also we, we're, we're proud to serve our customers and, and our communities while also paying our full, uh, full slate of taxes to support the federal government as well as what you're doing here in the state of Minnesota and contributing to those nice budget surpluses. Well, thank you, Mr. Witt and Ms. Kuvas. And I think I'm gonna hold member questions until we finish the other two testifiers for the banking industry. And so if you could yield the table but be available to come back uh, when Members have questions, and I know I have one. So um, next we'll call up Mr. Ryan Smith from Minnesota Credit Union Network. Afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Could you please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony? Would love to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Credit Union Network. We're the Trade Association for Credit Unions in Minnesota. And uh, just want to open up uh, by saying thank you very much. It's great to be back in person. It's been about three years since I've been able to testify in person. It's, it's a good feeling to be back actually in the Capitol. I uh, wanted to start off today with maybe a little bit of a primer for maybe some of the members that aren't necessarily familiar with what credit unions are. Credit unions are not-for-profit financial cooperatives uh, that operate, you know, that, that do checking accounts, savings accounts, uh, similar to other financial institution models, but because we're a nonprofit, we can we have that uh, profit motive removed and can uh, pump those <clears throat> back into, pump those profits back into savings on lower rates uh, for uh, loans, higher yields on savings, uh, and the like. Um, uh, oftentimes I get asked who can belong to a credit union. Um, I like to tell everybody that, or I like to tell people that not everybody can join every credit union, but there is a credit union out there for, uh, for you somewhere. Uh, basically you need to either live, work, or belong. So you either need to work in, uh, live or work in a defined geographic area uh, or potentially belong to an employer group or whatever that has a uh, that, uh, credit union segment that you can uh, join in that manner. Uh, in the history of credit unions, I included that as uh, a slide just because I thought it was kind of interesting that we're uh, closing in on the, the first credit union chartered was 1925 in Minnesota. Uh, so we're almost at 100 years and we're pretty excited about that, uh, that milestone. Um, they're much like banks, there are uh, two different charters, the federal and state. Uh, federal, cha uh, federal charters are primarily regulated by the National Credit Union Administration, whereas uh, state charters are primarily regulated by the State Department of Commerce. Uh, the NCUA is our federal regulator and insurer, so much like the FDIC, it does federal insurance on accounts for up to $250,000, uh, operates very much in that similar manner, and then also has that, that oversight for federal charters as well. Uh, and then again, like our colleagues at the banks, we have uh, uh, just a ton of, we're a very heavily regulated industry with examinations from the, uh, the NCUA, uh, the, the uh, State Department of Commerce does them. We, we have all kinds of other uh, safeguards for member money and accounts, uh, as well as supervisory committees which in, within each credit union as well that, that kind of functions in that regards uh, for safeguarding um, the, the, the member's money as it, as it stands. Uh, just in Minnesota these days, um, we've had a lot of industry consolidation over the last few years. When I started the network back in 2012, I can't believe it's been over 11 years now. Um, we had 145 credit unions then. We're about 88 credit unions now. So we've had a lot of consolidation. For the most part, that has been smaller credit unions merging into larger ones. Um, uh, our colleagues with the banks just mentioned the, you know, the cost of uh, data security. I mean, costs are just kind of going up across the board, and it gets more and more difficult for smaller institutions to kind of hold on. Um, so we have definitely seen a lot of consolidation. Uh, but one thing that I'm really proud of is that uh, despite the number of credit unions uh, going down, the number of branches 
uh, have, have maintained just about the same levels or even increased slightly. We're really proud of the fact that there, our members continue to serve uh, in a lot of areas that may not have easy access to uh, you know, traditional financial institutions. Uh, so we still have just about 400 branches. We're about 2.1 million members now, uh, employ just a little bit under 6,000 uh, employees statewide with about 37 billion uh, held in assets. Now, as I, as I mentioned, we've had a lot of consolidation and it's been a lot of smaller institutions merging into larger ones. And that being said, if you look at the next slide, uh, basically we're still about half of our members are under 100 million in assets. Um, so we still have a, a, a good portion of our members that are kind of the smaller mom and pop shops that, uh, that operate in a lot of places, a lot of corners across the state. Um, just in Minnesota, we, we put together some estimates that uh, our credit unions have provided about $135 million in direct financial benefits to our 2.1 million, men, uh, million members. Uh, in lower loan rates, uh, it's been about $71 million. Higher savings rates, about $47 million. And fewer and lower fees at $16 million. That basically equivalents to about $67 per member or $140 per household. Uh, the next slide kind of just goes a little bit. I wanted to include it so you see that the performance of our credit unions is, is pretty strong. Um, I think of a particular note in that second one, the loan and, uh, loan and savings growth trends, I think it kind of uh, you know, bears out what, uh, what we all see every day is that especially in the first half, first half of last year, our loan demand was you know, huge. I mean, between home loans, car loans, uh, that had severely uh, outpaced the, the growth in savings accounts, that had not been the case in the years prior, and it's starting to maybe normalize a little bit more as the, the interest rate hikes kind of really take, take effect and make it a little bit more costly to buy homes and cars, et cetera. But for the most part, uh, our folks are, are strong. Uh, our exposure to the interest rate risks are pretty low, and we're, overall, we're pretty healthy. Uh, one of the things that we tend to focus on as an industry and also within the credit unions themselves is financial education. Um, there's a bill that has been uh, made around the, its round last year, and I think we'll make it again this year, that would require financial literacy uh, as part of, of coursework. It's something that we're very supportive of. We actually have over 100 credit union professionals that do volunteer work in schools uh, to do financial literacy, kind of build up that knowledge base. Uh, and not just one time, but also to do it continuously, because I think as we all know, that the, the, the financial system really just kind of is constantly evolving. Uh, if you had said crypto five years ago to most high school kids, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. And now there are kids that are trying to buy crypto, buy Bitcoin and the like. Uh, Robinhood and the, the, its easy access is certainly uh, making it a lot, almost like a gamification. Uh, there are a lot of kids that are uh, investing in these things that don't really have any understanding of what that money is, where it goes, and how it's much more important to build up your credit score, you know, what it takes to actually buy a car, buy a house, et cetera. So our, our, our staff um, have been active uh, in schools and on their own in the communities on financial literacy for a long, long time, and it's something that we'll continue to do uh, moving forward. Um, also, uh, ensuring financial well-being for all, as our colleague said in, in, uh, with, the, with the banks, one of the biggest things that our folks have been engaged on is trying to find and help serve on and underserved communities. Uh, we worked, uh, again, in conjunction with our colleagues with the banks on a bill last year that was alluded to um, that uh, previously Minnesota state law had been that if you'd had an account forcibly closed for insufficient funds, uh, you couldn't go and open an account at another institution for a year. Uh, and this, uh, both the Senate and House uh, passed the bill last year to actually remove that requirement and allow financial institutions to, to actually open these accounts. I'm sure that the, the bill had been put in place originally to prevent fraud and people moving from uh, one institution to another uh, and just perpetrating fraud in perpetuity. But what we started to see as an end result of that was people who were otherwise well-intentioned who might be kind of on the edge uh, finding that they couldn't open an account at another institution. And there have been numerous studies to show that actually being outside of the traditional financial structure, it's much more expensive to operate in between payday loans and, and what have you. It's, it's, it's a really, get, you can get in really in a lot of trouble. So being able to serve these accounts again, I think is gonna be imperative for a lot of people and really be a beneficial to your communities. Um, another policy that the legislature worked on a few years ago was to allow for something called price link savings. Uh, basically, it, would, it creates an incentive for folks uh, to save uh, historically that maybe not have saved before. Uh, the, there was a bill that passed in Minnesota allowing these, these accounts to be held by financial institutions in 2015. Uh, as the Trade Association for Credit Unions, we actually took the initiative and created a product called Wincentive. 
And I have some stats in, in your packet for you uh, that in just about a uh, little over almost seven years, uh, we've had, what is it now, 87, almost uh, about 8750 accounts that have been set up and over $13 million that have been saved. Just kind of uh, by survey data, this is mostly savings. It's not shuffling from one place to another. It's mostly savings that wouldn't have been saved otherwise. Um, so it's been a really great product for our members and something that we think is a, a really good example of how good policy can help uh, the, you know, the private sector actually affect change in people's lives. Uh, and then the last thing I want to leave on is just uh, kind of touching on how we uh, interact with our communities. Uh, a few years back, we actually helped uh, with one of our credit unions, and now we've taken it statewide, on creating a day of service on uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in, in October every year. Uh, we've created a day called See You Forward Day, where because it's, it's already a national bank holiday, all of our branches are closed, where we've taken and organized volunteer work in all of our communities across the state. Uh, just last year, we had 66 of our credit unions, so almost more than two thirds of our credit unions that participated in this with over uh, 3,000 volunteers and something like 15,000 hours of volunteer time just done on this one day alone. And that's you know, packing uh, you know, food at the local food bank, um, you know, doing uh, Habitat for Humanity, like the, the volunteer uh, opportunities that we've had have just ranged across the spectrum and just kind of demonstrates the touch we have in our communities and how important it is for us and for our members that we're in there serving them as best we can. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, that completes uh, my thing. and happy to answer any questions a little bit later. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I also am glad that folks are coming back down to the Capitol to testify in purpose. person. I'm grateful for your uh, communications with our members today. And uh, let's bring forward Mr. Jim Amundsen, the President and CEO of Bank in Minnesota. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Senate Commerce Committee, thank Mr. you. Mr. Amundsen, if you could introduce yourself for the I record. Will, absolutely. My name is Jim Amundsen. I am the President and CEO of Bank in Minnesota. And uh, I'll spend a, just a minute or so on in my early comments uh, defining that for you a little bit because many of you are more familiar with us as the Independent Community Bankers of Minnesota, which is in and of itself a mouthful. Um, and part of the reason we made the change to our, our new name back in August. We announced at our convention, but it's not the primary reason. I won't go into too much detail, but um, ultimately we, um, we are a trade association that represents community banks in the state of Minnesota. And we, we have done so since 1962. And we, we hope that we're good partners in the work that you do here with lawmakers, but we also wanna build a platform, <coughs> excuse me, a platform to speak to the general public or the public in general uh, regarding community banks, how they're different, why they matter, what they do in, in each of their communities and, and why they're worthy of our uh, preservation and protection. So that's the real reason uh, we made that change. So I just want you to know that when you see that, um, understand that it's still us and, and we're, we're doing the same work, but we're hoping to use that as a platform to be more visible to the general public and distinguish ourselves between uh, the very largest banks, the credit unions, et cetera, all of which are important parts of our financial services sector, but we believe that we're an extremely important part and wanna make sure that we're doing all that we can to advocate on their behalf. In addition to the advocacy, we do events and education as well, and we pr provide member services that uh, community banks need specifically in, in how they operate their businesses. Um, and so next I will spend just a little bit of time talking about how they do operate their businesses, just so that you understand a little bit more. In the uh, materials that were provided to you, there's a cute little graphic. I can't take credit for creating that. I I'm not that creative. and. You might even find it uh, a little corny, but the truth of the matter is it's, it's how they operate. Um, when you start with the individuals in these communities and who they choose to bank with um, and who they choose to do business with in their community, ultimately we're hoping that they're choosing their community bank uh, to trust with their deposits and their other financial services needs. Uh, those deposits then flow into the community, into small businesses, family farms, home mortgages, et cetera, and as those businesses and other entities prosper, uh, obviously, they create important services, quality of life, um, uh, create jobs, employ people. And as, as all of that builds momentum and, and prosperity and positive uh, outcomes, uh, neighborhoods thrive and, and the, peoples within them, the people within them thrive. And so that's really the essence of it, the, the local nature of it, um, usually local ownership, local decision making. Um, I like to emphasize that uh, some people have the perception that they maybe have to give up uh, some 
needs from a technology standpoint with community banks, which is absolutely not the truth. Um, technology has scaled. Um, we like to call it a high-tech, high-touch model, so you can get the tech you need, but you can also get the personal service and, and the, the uh, support that you need. So that's really the, um, you know, I just wanted to spend a little time with you today to help understand who we are as an organization and kind of how our industry is different. I would love to spend a little more time with you when, any time that you would like. Um, you should have received or will receive shortly. We do have some legislative priorities that we're, you know, we have on our radar this year. I won't go into them right now, of course, but um, if you haven't received it, you will shortly, and we will certainly be looking to spend some time with you. The last uh, um, slide in your packet is uh, just my contact information, and we also work with Goff Public uh, as our contract lobbyist, Elizabeth Emerson. Uh, Pierre is here with us as well today and her team. You're going to see them more around the Capitol, certainly, than you'll see me, but I'm available. Uh, I spent 25 years as a community banker prior to this role, so I, I know the industry well, and so if you have questions related to banking in general or uh, community banking specifically, I'd be happy to help at any time. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I don't know if you'd like to sure. you mention taking questions all at once. I don't know if you want me to remain or if you'd like to uh, sure yes yeah, so thank you mr. Up. Amundsen thank you for sharing the experience of community banks with our members and if you could stay where you are sure uh, and at this point I will open it up to member questions for any of the four testifiers uh, in the banking industry um, go to mr. Rasp uh, Senator Rasmussen thank you mr. chair uh, question for mr. Amundsen I'm assuming that a, a good percentage of your members are state chartered banks and I was wondering if you've heard any concerns around the cost of audits um, that have come along with state charter banks? I've heard from a couple of constituents uh, just you know, seeing rising costs to conduct those audits and just wanted to see if you've been hearing that across the state or maybe that's not an issue for your members. I, I would say that it's, um, you know, state charter banks do pay um, annual assessments and they also pay fees when they do have an exam from the Department of Commerce. Um, and there's, you know, the Department of Commerce, would, the department would probably be better able to talk about their budget and how they fund it. Um, those, those costs have gone up. There's no doubt about that. Um, part of it is, you know, we do believe strongly in, in the state banking system and understand the reality of uh, what's going on in the marketplace to um, attract uh, examiners, retain them, train them, develop them. Uh, there was, a, and it may still be happening to a certain extent, but... Um, start at the state and then move to the Fed or the OCC where uh, there's more compensation, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, are banks happy when they get those bills? I would say no. Um, am I seeing widespread or hearing widespread um, unhappiness? I'm not, to be honest with you. Senator Rasmussen, you're all set. Any other members? I have a question, if not, for uh, Mr. Witt, if you could come back to the table. Two of the testifiers um, spoke to recent uh, legislation that we had passed here, uh, which they felt was beneficial not only to the industry but to Minnesotans in general and consumer protection areas. Mr. Witt, you spoke about the senior financial uh, legislation that we passed in 2020, and then the credit union representative spoke about uh, the incentive program. And it's encouraging to hear that, you know, we passed a law that sort of affects your industry and you didn't view it, view it as overly burdensome. You thought it was beneficial and it worked well and, and we helped Minnesotans. And can you speak a little bit more, I guess, about that program in particular? What aspects of it you thought were uh, well-crafted legislation to guide this committee in the year ahead? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the, the main purpose of that was to give us an opportunity to slow down transactions. Um, we spend a lot of uh, energy... Um, educating our bankers on what to look for in the area of fraud. A lot of times it's the same stuff that you hear about over and over again. It's the Nigerian scams or it's the kid who's in Mexico or whatever. And um, you'd think that by now everybody would know that those things are scams, but still people do get, um, you know, they get so wrapped up in it that they um, think it's real. So as a financial intermediary, the, the bank's job is to process transactions that are requested by our customers. That's our job. And so before we pass this bill that, that would allow us to slow it down, um, we would have been subject to liability for not processing that transaction in a timely fashion. By slowing it down and giving us some time to um, 
bring in law enforcement or talk to other family members or just get them to think about it before they press the go button, um, we've been able to stop a lot of that fraud. Um, I also want to say that the State Department of Commerce has been extremely helpful in this area too. They have fraud investigators. Um, sometimes we've just called them directly, got them on the phone. When they hear it from multiple sources that they need to really think about this before doing the transaction, it's been really helpful to stop um, a lot of that senior fraud from happening. And I know the Department of Commerce mentioned it's been millions of dollars of, of uh, fraud that's been caught, um, and we've been able to protect our, our, our customers, and, and the Commerce Department's been able to protect our citizens. Does that address your question, sir? It does. Thank you, Mr. Witt. Any other member questions? Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Witt. Chair. Could I just maybe address the, the question that was raised earlier? Mr. Witt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there is one thing that we've been looking at closely. In addition to the regular bank exams and in addition to being um, going through audits by our, by our accountants, there is a, a requirement for state chartered banks to get a director's audit. And we have talked to the Department of Commerce about whether that audit is still necessary now that they have all the additional information quarterly and all that other stuff. So um, to address your question, uh, Senator, that is one that we have been looking at and um, maybe looking at some relief from that particular one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, yes. And uh, we will now call forward Mr. Dan Andresen from the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Good afternoon, Mr. Andreessen. Could you introduce yourself for the record, please, and proceed with your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dan Andreessen. I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs and Policy with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Um, and is this showing up on your monitor? Okay. Um, well, I'll just get started with introductory remarks here. So. Um, maybe it's this button. It does okay. All right. um, so the slides I'm going to present to you today is a subset of a longer presentation that we've done on uh, for members regarding the basics of health insurance, how it operates. Sorry, Mr. Andreessen, you're there. It is. Oh, okay. um, how it operates, how it's regulated here in Minnesota. So this is kind of a high level uh, presentation. So if you. You'd like, we'd love to come meet with you and kind of go deeper into how insurance works here in Minnesota. So a little bit first about the council itself. Uh, so we are the trade association for the nonprofit insurers here in Minnesota. Uh, so that's Blue Cross Blue Shield, Minnesota, Health Partners, Medica, uh, Sanford Health, UCARE, and Hennepin Health. Um, and this is an intentional when the council was created back in the 80s that um, all of our members had a commitment to the nonprofit mission uh, serving our community um, in this, the space of healthcare. Uh, so we don't, we're a little bit different than other trade associations in that we don't represent all insurers here in the state, such as the, the larger for-profits. Um, but if uh, questions arise regarding any of our members, please let us know. Uh, but we are a significant part um, insurer here in the state. Um, collectively, our members insure around 92% of state regulated markets. Uh, that's both commercially and in uh, the Medicaid market. Um, and employ over 40,000 Minnesotans throughout the state. So why have health insurance? Uh, so the first two that come to mind is, is generally what you expect with insurance. It provides you financial protection from unexpected <coughs> health, um, health events, um, but it's also a way to finance your health care costs. So it's, this is where it's a little bit different than other pieces of insurance where you may buy a policy and never use it, whereas with health insurance, you're buying it to use it. It's spreading out your costs um, throughout the year uh, as opposed to just you paying it out of pocket as a health uh, situation arises, uh, but also allows um, insurers to pool together um, a population so that the, the variabilities you would see in terms of healthcare costs tend to be leveled out so it helps everybody in general. Uh, but it's more than just about paying claims. Um, we also, uh, work with our members to um, give them access to preventive services and wellness initiatives to improve their health as best we can, um, helping them navigate healthcare choices uh, with providers and, and so forth, and working with our provider partners to ensure that 
uh, the care that's being delivered is of the highest quality standards. So um, health insurance is also a highly regulated industry. Um, we're regulated both at the state and federal level. Uh, here at the state level, we're regulated by three departments, the Department of Commerce, Health, and Human Services. Um, and we're regulated in a variety of different ways. Uh, first is our financials. Um, all of the insurers here in the state need to be licensed, uh, prove that they're solvent so that they are going to be able to pay claims um, and pay them timely. Um, rates that, um, that are charged in the fully insured market, which I'll explain in a second, are all approved by Commerce. Um, they have Plans have to go through a rate review process to prove that the premiums that they're collecting um, are, are match what is expected health care costs for the year, um, and they're actuarial is sound. Um, insurers also have to meet what's called a medical loss ratio, which is uh, a term that essentially means um, health plans have to spend a certain amount of percentage of their premiums on health care expenses. So this may vary depending on the market, but it's anywhere from 80 to 85%. Uh, so this is ensuring that the premiums that health insurers are taking on, they're actually using it for care. Um, and this, this topic kind of came up mostly during the pandemic where healthcare utilization was a little bit lower than expected. Um, and so health insurers collected a certain amount of premium thinking this was you know, one way and then COVID went another way and healthcare utilization went down. Um, and in these cases, um, insurers had to return premium dollars to their enrollees. Uh, back in 2020, I think the national number was around $2 billion insurers had to collectively send back to, insure, to their enrollees. Insurers also have to follow coverage requirements that are set both at the federal and state level. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with the ACA and um, coverage for pre-existing conditions. Uh, the ACA also lays out 10 essential health benefits that all insurers have to provide coverage for. <coughs> so that includes hospitals, ambulance, laboratory, um, maternity care, and others. Um, states can also enact additional uh, benefit mandates. Um, right now, Minnesota has put around 60 additional mandates um, into law that any insurer in the state have to follow in, in state regulated markets. markets. And then lastly, uh, provider networks um, are also regulated. Insurers try to create networks that are, are robust in terms of the provider mix and geographic availability. Uh, but we also have adequacy requirements that we must follow um, that are regulated by the Department of Health. Um, if uh, an insurer fails to meet those requir requirements, they have to pay a fee to MDH. So where do Minnesotans get their health coverage? So there's kind of three main areas. Uh, first is from an employer, um, and the first example here is what are called self-insured plans. So this is like the large corporations. Um, you go, you work there, and part of your benefit set is getting insurance um, through that employer. Um, they they hire an insurance company to administer the program, but the it's the company that is creating that product. They're the ones setting the coverage um, and cost. You can also get it through a what's called the small and large group market. So these are the smaller, uh, medium-sized employers where they're buying insurance for their employees. Um, and then lastly is the CGIP program, which some of you may be enrolled in, uh, but it's for all state employees uh, to get their insurance um, through the state. So in this market, it's highly, reg uh, highly subsidized by your employer, so you're paying a little bit for your premiums out of your, your paycheck. Um, but your employer is picking up the majority of your premium. You can also get health coverage through a federal or state program. Um, so many of these you're probably familiar with. The Medicare program for those who are over 65 or those who are younger who are living with disability. Uh, the TRICARE program is for active duty military and veterans. Uh, the Medicaid program uh, called medical assistance here in Minnesota is for lower income Minnesotans or those with special circumstances. Um, and then the Minnesota Care Program. Uh, Minnesota has is one of two states with what's called a basic health program for those um, between 133 and 200% of poverty can enroll in that. Um, so in this case, this is this area is highly subsidized by federal taxes uh, or state and federal taxes. Um, so you pay very little a premium, probably very little out of pocket. Um, government is paying for the majority of your care. 
So this leaves um, the individual market, which is this, if you don't fall in one of the other two buckets, you would go out on MinSure or work with a broker to buy insurance on your own. Um, so in this case, there are tax credits available. Um, Minnesota has a reinsurance program that helps kind of subsidize this market. Um, but in this situation, you, as the person purchasing that product, you're paying most of that premium. Um, so this is not as subsidized as the other, other areas, which is why premiums tend to be higher for that person. So how that breaks down here in Minnesota, um, so most folks get their insurance through a self-insured you know, corporate type level plan, um, around 36%. Um, and I'll mention this, these numbers are from 2017. Um, so currently they're probably a little bit different, but we expect that this is where the market's gonna come back to post pandemic. Um, after that, um, we have around you know, the same amount of folks in the Medicare, Medicaid, uh, small and large group markets, so around 16, 17%. Um, and then a smaller portion of folks in the individual market, Minnesota Care, CGIP, and TRICARE. So that leaves around 4% or so of Minnesotans that are uninsured. Um, so as I wrap up, um, I wanna kind of just leave you with a discussion on how, how these markets are all regulated because that will impact uh, both policy making um, because not all of these areas can be regulated by the state, um, but also trying to find solutions when problems arise. Uh, so. Um, when someone comes to us, probably the first question we'll have for you is, do you know where you know, your constituent or so forth has, where they're getting their insurance? Because that will help us determine the best course of action for finding a solution. So generally, um, all these markets are regulated federally, but um, the self-insured market, Medicare and TRICARE is uh, primarily a regu regu regulated federally. Um, and in fact, those in the, the self-insured market um, can't be regulated by state changes, they're preempted by ERISA. Um, and this is because they're the ones taking on the risk, they're the ones kind of setting the policy. So in this situation, if someone is in a self-insured plan and they're having uh, concerns with their insurance, their best course of action is actually to talk to their HR department because it's the company that's setting the, the plan. So that leaves the other side of the pie chart. Um, and these are areas that are regulated by the state so that includes um, the state public programs of Medicaid and Minnesota Care, um, the state employee plan here known as CGIP, and then the individual market and small and large group market, which, sorry to give you another term, but those are called the fully insured market, um, which I had referenced earlier when I said that rates were approved by commerce. These are those rates that are approved in those areas. Um, so as a council, uh, we want to work with you and be a partner um, as situations arise. Please reach out to us so we can find solutions um, to uh, any insurance issues you come across. And then our last slide is just our, our staff here. Please reach out if you have any questions anytime. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Andreessen. Any member questions for the health plans? Uh -huh. I do have one. Um, I'm always struck by your slide uh, showing uh, that it's only 5% of Minnesotans that are on the individual market or slightly over that. And I always like to say that we spend maybe 95% of our energy and intellectual work up here addressing those 5% uh, of Minnesotans. Um, can you share with the committee you know, how many individuals that actually ends up being? And then a second part of the question, of course, I'm gonna let you speak a little bit about reinsurance since it's by and large the vast majority of the spreadsheet for this committee. Um, I, I'm just going to have you comment, you know, on sort of the effectiveness of that. And, of course, those are dollars that go exclusively to the 5% the of individuals uh, that you've pointed out on your pie chart and um, just your reactions, you know, five or six years in about uh, that program. Uh, Mr. Chair, so the individual market's around 130, uh, 100, um, 130,000 Minnesotans. So these are folks who kind of just... In, in some ways kind of fall through the cracks of the other two buckets. So they're, they don't work for a big corporation um, or they're, they're not you know, eligible for a state or federal program. So these could be farmers, it could be small business owners, um, it could be younger people who are, are employed but their employer doesn't provide them insurance. Um, and so that's where they would go to the individual market. Um, the reinsurance program is a way to, to subsidize that by bringing down premiums and so, um, what happens is that 
um, insurance companies, you know, they they pay the claims um, for that year, and then afterwards, a year later, um, any claims between fifty thousand and two hundred fifty thousand can be reimbursed at an eighty percent uh, level. Um, and by knowing that that is coming in, they're able to bring down premiums for everybody in the market. Um, so that money is going towards people who are living with diabetes, living with um, cancer, uh, heart conditions, and all of that money is, is tracked by uh, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, and there's quarterly and annual reports that dict, you know, document where that money is going in terms of who and where and, and so forth. Um, so um, it's been a, a really good way to bring down premiums um, that before we just didn't have that subsidization. Well, thank you, Mr. Andreessen. I appreciate your testimony. Thanks for coming to the Capitol today. I look forward to working with you this year. And can we have uh, Mr. Aaron Cocking from the Minnesota, Minnesota Insurance Foundation come forward? <clears throat> Mr. Cocking, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Good afternoon, my name is Aaron Cocking. I'm the President and CEO of the Insurance Federation of Minnesota. The Insurance Federation of Minnesota has been the voice of insurance at the Capitol for over 100 years. We exist to represent the voices of policyholders and insurers to legislators and regulators, especially when you're making decisions about insurance. I look forward to bringing that voice to this committee again this year. And particularly, I represent the property casualty side of the insurance industry. Property meaning coverage that financially protect, protects your stuff, and casualty, which provides protection to you if you are responsible for causing injury or to harm to someone else or to their property. These encompass personal lines insurance, such as auto, home, and renters, as well as commercial insurance, which includes commercial property, commercial auto, workers' compensation, and business insurance. Now, in its most basic form, insurance is a contract which transfers risk from the policyholder to an insurer to protect some asset. And this transfer of risk allows all of us to live higher quality of lives because we know our stuff is protected. Some of you heard me say this before, and I'm sure you'll hear me say it again. I think we all live higher quality lives as a result of insurance. We, live, we drive nicer vehicles, we live in nicer homes, we have nicer things because of the, of the protection and peace of mind provided by insurance. However, insurance is unlike any other product or service because insurers don't know what their cost will be until after they've sold their product. Instead, they rely on the law of large numbers to statistically predict what they can expect their cost will be. So as you consider legislation this year, consider that each additional requirement you mandate comes at a cost. Whether it's requiring coverage of someone else on the policy, requiring a higher limit, mandating coverage that is currently voluntary, all of that comes at a cost to the policyholder. And why is that? Well, in the most basic terms, additional re costs require additional premium to pay those losses. Carriers will look at the decisions made in Minnesota and determine if additional premium will be required to cover these additional risks. Now, insurance has a lot of terms that we use, but I want to mention two specifically today, frequency and severity. We use these terms to look at losses and loss trends. Frequency means how often or how many claims a company has, while severity means the cost of each of those claims. For example, when COVID hit and people were driving less, we saw fewer accidents leading to less frequency, but the accidents that did happen were more severe and more expensive, a rise in severity. Any action that pushes either side of that equation higher will come at a cost. And those terms are important in any of the policy discussions this committee has. So many of you have probably seen an increase in your insurance premiums over the past few years, and you might be wondering, why is that? Well, let me offer you a couple of reasons based on what we're seeing in the industry. First, on the auto side, repairing and replacing vehicles has become incredibly more complex and expensive. The cost of parts and labor and the processes involved in fixing newer vehicles is much more expensive and intense than it was even 10 years ago. And on cars that have been deemed a total loss, the availability of used cars has been much tighter than we're used to seeing. 
And we all know from Econ 101 that as supply constricts, prices go higher. And those higher costs are reflected in the form of higher premium. Now on the homeowner side, much of the increased costs are as a result of Minnesota weather and our changing climate. Minnesota has the second most extreme weather of any state in the country, second only to California. Wind and hail lead some of the costliest repairs consumers face. The changing climate has led to more intense storms more often. For the first time in as long as many people can remember, Minnesota had tornadoes in December of 2021. Most companies had long assumed and based their risk models on the assumption that those types of storms were finished for the year when December rolled around. Turns out that might not be true. We often point to the storms that rolled through the North Metro in June of 2017. Those were the most expensive storms in Minnesota history, causing $3.2 billion in damage in a matter of minutes. That was the 10th most expensive storm in the world, in the world that year. And I mention that because Minnesota isn't isolated when it comes to insurance and, the, and some of the cost drivers. Increases in hurricanes, wildfires, and, and flooding have led to an increase in premium. Companies used to be able to look back 20, 30, 40, 50 years to create the data set to base their loss estimates on. The problem we're seeing now is storms that used to occur every 25 or 50 years are now happening every five or 10 years, maybe more frequently. And that has led to significantly higher claims costs. So you might be wondering, how do we know that companies aren't using these storms as a pretext to raise rates? And it's because insurers are regulated, are a regulated industry. In Minnesota, we're regulated by the Minnesota Department of Commerce who reviews these things. And the issues faced in Minnesota are different than issues faced in California, Colorado, Florida, or any other coastal state. But it's great to have a Minnesotan working through these issues with us and not a bureaucrat in DC. It's not to say we have a cozy relationship with the DOC. The Department of Commerce is able to regulate our industry by conducting market conduct exams, which is looking at how companies operate in the market. They also review uh, and approve rates and forms to make sure they comply with the law the legislature passes. So as we start the process this year and you consider legislation that impacts insurance, I would ask you to consider a few things. Please oppose bills that prevent insurers from having the freedom to underway, underwrite in a way that is best for their policyholders. We would ask that you oppose any additional coverage mandates that will drive up the price for Minnesota policyholders. Minnesota has an incredibly competitive insurance market. You have to look no further than any football game on Sunday afternoon. Minnesota has an incredibly competitive insurance market. And making sure companies have the ability to, def to freely determine what products are best for their policyholders is critical to maintaining that competitiveness. Thank you for the opportunity to give you an overview. Uh, I'm sure we'll see a fair amount of each other this year. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have either now or in the future. Well, Mr. Awesome. Chairman. Thank you so much, Mr. Coggin. Thank you for introducing yourself and your industry to the committee. Are there any questions from the committee? <laughs> I guess you're set. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and can Mr. Brist Brent Christensen please come forward from the Minnesota Telecom Alliance? Good afternoon, Mr. Christensen. Whenever your video is set up there, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and uh, you proceed the, with your testimony. Can't see the monitor? Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brent Christensen, and I'm the president and CEO of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, and I'm really hoping the Attorney General doesn't walk in in the next minute. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about MTA and then about how our different lines of businesses are, are regulated. Um, MTA is made up of 41 uh, member companies. 22 of them are cooperatives. Nine of them are family owned, and that's where I come from. My family has owned a, a telephone company in Medelia, Minnesota, for, and I'm the fifth generation involved in that. We have five commercial companies that are members of MTA, two competitive local exchange carriers, two other companies, and I call them others because they're telephone companies that are owned by other telephone companies, and they're the incumbent in the communities that they serve. And then we have one company that's an incumbent municipally owned telephone company, and that's in Barnesville. 
I want to start off my comments today by saying that telecom is the only competitive utility, and I think that's, that's important. Uh, we don't talk a lot about that um, outside of this, and people don't think about that, but we are the only competitive utility out there. It's not like electric or it's not like, like uh, gas or water. They don't have competition in their monopolies. And up until 1996, so were we. But the Federal Act of 96 changed that uh, and made us a competitive, a competitive utility. So why is a competitive utility different? Well, it's no longer build them and they will come. It is that we have to be strategic about where we plan our, our infrastructure changes. We have to make sure that we get um, facilities upgraded and, uh, and arranged where, where we know that we're going to get customers. And it's no longer we can bury fiber out to somebody and we know that we're going to pick everybody up. So they have choices, consumers have choices, and I call them the fifth regulator. And I'm going to talk about how we're regulated, but um, the consumer is the fifth regulator, and they decide where they're going to get their service from. So our members have three main lines of business that we provide. Uh, plain old telephone service, or POTS. Uh, you would know that as landline telephone service. Uh, that comes from a traditional telephone company. We also provide broadband internet to our customers. And then also most of our companies provide video services, or you might think of that as, as cable TV. And I'm going to talk about how each one of those lines are, are regulated. On the landline telephone side of the business, uh, as we're competitors, I'm going to compare and contrast how we're, we're competitive or we're regulated versus our competitors. We're regulated by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commissioner, Commission. Our competition is not. We're regulated by the Department of Commerce. Our competition is not. We're regulated by the Office of the Attorney General. Our competition is not, for the most part. And we're regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. Our competitors, which would be cable providers, cellular providers, and VoIP providers like Vonage or Magic Jack, they're only re regulated by the, by the FCC. Broadband internet, we're regulated. We provide that service via fiber. Uh, we do fixed wireless, and we also provide it over traditional and uh, landline copper plant. That's regulated by the FCC, and there's a limited oversight by the Public Utilities Commission, and that depends on certain federal dollars that the companies expect or accept. And that's the same for our competitors. They provide their services over fiber as well, coax cable, fixed wireless, and satellite. Our video services are regulated by local franchise agreements, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, same with cable providers they, like Comcast and Charter, they have local franchise agreements. Satellite providers like DISH and DirecTV, they're regulated by the FCC. And then streaming services, which a lot of people are cutting their cord and they're going with streaming services, those aren't regulated at all. And Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, and I think somebody's standing behind me because everybody's looking behind me, so um, <laughs> I'd be happy to stand for questions. Mr. Christensen, thank you so much for your helpful and uh, terse uh, testimony. I'm grateful that you came to the Capitol today to introduce yourselves to the committee. Uh, are there any member questions for Mr. Christensen? All right, thank you for your testimony, right. sir. And, and uh, at this time, if I could ask uh, the Office of the Attorney General, Keith Ellison, to come forward. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Good. Good afternoon, Attorney General. Go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Welcome. to the, It's a privilege to have you before the committee. Thank you, sir. Well, my name is Keith Ellison. I'm the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota, and it's a, certainly an honor to be uh, with you, Mr. Chairman, but also Vice Chair Seberger and Ranking Member Doms. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, <clears throat> you've asked me to provide an overview of the consumer protection work that the Attorney General's office does and I'm very proud of this work and my staff who work on it every single day. Let me start with authority, our legal authority. The Minnesota Constitution establishes the office of the Attorney General to serve as the state's chief legal officer. Sometimes people think it's I'm the chief law enforcement officer. That's actually not accurate. Uh, but uh, we, I am the chief legal officer per, per Constitution. The role and duties of the Attorney General arise from the Minnesota Constitution, as I noted, state statutes, specifically and generally Chapter 8, uh, and also common law and Minnesota case law. But we also have authority under uh, several other Minnesota statutes, which I'll mention in a moment, but chief, chiefly Chapter 8. 
Uh, one of the most important duties uh, is protecting Minnesota's consumers uh, as the chief uh, enforcer of the state's consumer protection laws. The Attorney General has broad and comprehensive statutory and common law authority to do so. First, uh, Minnesota Statute Section 8.31, the legislature uh, has directed me uh, as the Attorney General to investigate and prosecute, quote, violations of law in this state respecting unfair, discriminatory, or other unlawful practices in business, commerce, or trade. Uh, I take this responsibility very seriously, and so do my staff. The legislature has also passed numerous other consumer-related laws that the Attorney General enforces, and I'd like to just highlight a few of them and give you a few examples. We enforce the Consumer Fraud Act uh, and the Uniform Deceptive Trade Practices Act. These laws broadly prohibit fraud, misrepresentation, deceptive practices, and other unlawful trade practices such as engaging in conduct likely to confuse consumers. We enforce the False Statement and Advertising Act, which prohibits untrue, deceptive, and misleading statements in advertising in any medium. We enforce laws regulating home and personal solicitation sales, uh, which um, require, among other things, conspicuous notice of the three-day right to cancel a sale uh, and door-to-door -door salesperson disclosures uh, to prevent deceptive practices. We enforce a variety of laws banning unlawful and unlicensed lending, unlawful debt collection, unlawful debt management, and unlawful debt settlement practices. Um, we also uh, enforce several chapters of the state law to protect the rights of tenants and mobile home park residents. Uh, and we also enforce the Antitrust Act. We also enforce laws in regarding Minnesota charities. Uh, which are also a consumer uh, in this consumer area. We investigate suspected violations of these laws through civil investigative demands. That's basically interrogatories, uh, depositions, things like that. Um, we call them civil investigative demands. And under uh, the law, we can seek injunctive relief, which simply means we can get the offending party to stop doing or start doing what they should do or should not do, depending. Uh, civil penalties up to twenty-five thousand per violation, restitution, disgorgement, and other equitable remedies, including uh, in the cost of an investigation and attorneys' fees. Now, I'd like to highlight, if I may, it's the areas of work that we focus our, our attention on, and I can't give you an, an exhaustive list because it's just too long. But I'll give you some things that are illustrative of what we do every day. Uh, let me start with unlawful practices in the pharmaceutical industry. <clears throat> We've held pharmaceuticals, I mean, uh, manufacturers of pharmaceuticals, distributors, also pharmacies, uh, responsible uh, in a number of areas, including the opioid epidemic uh, that has cost over 5,500 Minnesotans their lives and cost public, uh, the public uncountable public dollars. We've reached settlements with a dozen companies that involve uh, that involve uh, a, a large amount of money. Uh, it'll come up to several hundred million dollars so far. Uh, I'll be a little bit more specific in a moment, but these dollars are ones that come back to the state or go to, low in, or go to victims. Uh, so far, <clears throat> we have ensured that Minnesota will get more than $300 million in one settlement over the next 18 years. We're in the middle of negotiating of five settlements right now, uh, which we expect will uh, uh, bring back $235 million to the state of Minnesota. Uh, while no amount of money can ever make up for the death and the loss and destruction that these companies have caused, we're holding them accountable. We also have demanded non-monetary relief. Uh, I was speaking um, with, one of our with one of your colleagues uh, earlier, uh, Representative Baker, who lost a child to this crisis, and uh, he said to me, you know, yeah, the money is important, but what's more important that these people be revealed for what they did, and so transparency is a really important thing for us in nearly every settlement, no, in every settlement, it says nearly right here, but in every settlement uh, that we've reached, we have made sure that these companies disclose millions of internal documents um, we need to know exactly what these companies did uh, so that they won't ever do it again. 
And uh, there is a central depository of these documents uh, where anyone can research their, uh, their, their sales tactics and other, other, uh, other uh, behaviors. In addition to holding the opioid uh, companies accountable, along with large, a large coalition of states and territories, we're continuing to sue uh, dozens of generic drug manufacturers and their executives for illegally conspiring to fix prices and allocate markets in over 180 generic drugs. Interesting that uh, we always think of the generic drug alternative as the cheaper one, but they have engaged in illegal price fixing and market allocation, and we're suing them for it. Uh, we're also continuing to litigate our lawsuit against the, three, the nation's three largest insulin manufacturers who we allege fraudulently, fraudulently set artificially high list prices for their insulin products, then negotiate much lower secret actual prices by paying rebates to pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, and although this is not litigation, uh, we also have the authority and do use it uh, to establish um, task forces through the Attorney General's office. We did establish a task force uh, on lowering pharmaceutical drug prices, uh, and we convened and issued a report in, 20, in 2020, 2019, 2020. Uh, that report we released uh, with 14 recommendations for making markets better, work better for people, using the public power to make drugs more affordable and accessible, and requiring transparency and accountability in the pharmaceutical drug market. One of these recommendations uh, became law when the legislature passed the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act of 2020, and I want to thank you for your work on that. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, when, when pharma uh, t went to court to defeat the law and have it declared unconstitutional, we went to defend it, and uh, we've been winning so far. Uh, I'm proud to say the task, the task force report, which I just mentioned, won a notable document award from the National Conference of State Legislatures in 2020. The next area that I'd like to highlight for you in the consumer protection area is protecting the rights of tenants and mobile home park residents. And as I say the words mobile home park, there's nothing mobile about a mobile home park. They stay where they are, uh, and yet the, the law it treats them a little bit differently. In the area of regular rental housing, in 2019, <clears throat> September, we sued a Minneapolis landlord named Stephen Meldahl for including numerous misleading deceptive provisions in, in his leases with tenants, including misrepresenting to them that if they did not had, that they did not have a right to live in habitable housing and could not have their homes inspected by local authorities without his permission. Uh, that was in the lease. It's an illegal lease provision, and we had it struck. And, uh, and in November uh, 2021, after a trial, Hennepin County Judge uh, uh, Robbins uh, agreed. He found in favor of the tenants and the Attorney General's office, and he said that uh, Meldahl's business practices were, quote, brazen and deplorable, unquote, uh, and found that uh, the landlord and illegally forces tenants to live in conditions of what he called biblical plague proportions, including rats, gnats, and squirrels. In fact, one uh, witness testified that they just had abandoned the bathroom because the squirrels had completely taken it over. Um, and uh, we actually were able to secure uh, uh, a, over $1.2 million in fines and attorney's fees and uh, monies for the tenants. Currently, we're suing Havenbrook and Pretty and Partners, who rent more than 600 single-family homes in the metro area for severely under-maintaining their homes and uh, having many families uh, live in unlicensed and uninhabitable conditions. We also uh, are pursuing the owner of Broadmoor Valley Mobile Home Park in Marshall, Minnesota, for failing to maintain the roads and common areas to the, st uh, to the standard required by Minnesota law, including misleading and deceptive provisions in the leases. We also uh, took action in Northfield, Minnesota, where we protected uh, mobile home park residents without uh, having to sue at all. We didn't even have to file that lawsuit uh, when we learned that the new owners of the park had illegally imposed new lease provisions, which were arbitrary and in many cases cruel, and I could detail that for you at another time. Um, the fact is, is that the park residents came to us we told the Viking Terrace owners that they could not, that their provisions that they were imposing on their tenants were not 
within the law, and they backed off and we settled the matter without litigation, which is always a plus. And I want to commend the landlords in that situation. They did listen, and I'm happy about that. Uh, much of the tenant landlord tenant protection work is being done by something we call the Special Outreach and Protection Unit. This unit investigates and brings enforcement actions to stop or deter deceptive and unlawful practices that target um, you know, vulnerable communities that might be spatially remote, might have language disabilities or barriers. We know that unfair and deceptive practices often lurk in <coughs> parts of our community where people feel the most isolated. Um, <clears throat> uh, next, let me mention the protecting our, the rights of students, uh, particularly in the area of student loans. After years of litigation against the Minnesota School of Business, Globe University, for fraudulently marketing to students that their so-called criminal justice program, which cost between forty dollars and $80,000, could land students a job in the law enforcement field, which it could not because it did not have certification to even issue that degree, uh, we took them to court and we won that case and, and we, they, we went it all the way up to the Minnesota Supreme Court where we won and my office secured a $40 million debt forgiveness and restitution program for 4,000 students. Colleges cannot say that you will have a job in an area where they're not even licensed to issue certificates in that area. And so that was the heart of that lawsuit. We settled an investigation into unfair debt, student debt servicing practices by Navient, uh, the National Student Loan Servicer, for $14 million in loan cancellations and restitutions to over 4,000 Minnesota students. Uh, and then also, uh, we pursued a similar action in the now defunct ITT Tech uh, for student loan forgiveness, benefiting um, uh, 1,400 students in Minnesota. Uh, and this and other work is designed to uh, protect students' rights as they try to better their lives. So far, we've since I've been at the AG's office, we've netted more than $80 million back to students in the form of direct payment and restitution or debt relief forgiveness for, the un, for those loans. Also, false advertising and unlawful door-to-door -door sales. We're continuing to litigate against the vaping manufacturer, Juul, because, uh, and, and its uh, partial owner, Altria. Why? Because they, we allege that they violated Minnesota consumer protection laws uh, by, and created a public nuisance by deceptively marketing highly addictive e-cigarettes to youth, uh, replicating the same playbook that Big Tobacco used years ago. Uh, that case is set for trial in March. Uh, we've also sued for, recently four Utah-based solar panels companies uh, known as Brio and three, other, and three of their executives for engaging in fraudulent, deceptive marketing and the sales practices when selling residential solar panel systems to Minnesotans. These included salespersons misrepresenting their affiliation with local utilities, uh, how much money the consumers would save, uh, which was never as much as they said it would, and tricking consumers into signing binding sales contracts and loan agreements without informing them of their right to cancel, which they have to do. Uh, we've reached settlement with almost all of the companies and they are banned from conducting in any further business in Minnesota and are paying more than 200,000 in restitution to customers. And you should know that the Solar Panels Association, which is a Minnesota trade group, actually gave us an, aw an award because they wanna make sure that who's ever selling solar products uh, to consumers uh, is trustworthy and reputable and they didn't want these bad actors uh, in the Minnesota market, uh, and so they recognized our, our, uh, our work in that area. Coming to the close now, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to say that uh, we also are, have a very robust and, and actually growing anti-monopoly uh, group, uh, and uh, we've, we've joined nine other states in the Federal Trade Commission in bringing an enforcement action against pesticide manufacturers, Syngenta and Corvetta, uh, specifically, we allege these manufacturers establish loyalty programs for certain active ingredients in their branded pesticide products that illegally suppress competition from generic manufacturers. This is, you know, we're, we're a country that believes in free enterprise. This anti-competitive behavior is bad for consumers, bad for small business, bad for startups, and we're working to stop it. Um, and let me just finish up by saying that 
We uh, also uh, are working hard to protect low-wage workers. Uh, I want to thank you all for passing a nation-leading wage theft bill. That was very important, and this Minnesota legislature has responded to the needs of low-wage workers, and I, and I thank you for that. But somebody has to enforce the law, and that falls to me. So um, <clears throat> we established a wage theft unit to do the work. Uh, I can report to you that we have more people asking us to work on this issue than we have lawyers to do the work, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, I'd like to just mention two ongoing cases. One is uh, we filed a lawsuit against the gig economy company Shipped uh, for misclassifying its delivery workers as independent contractors. We claim Ship fails to lawfully classify its workers and employees when they are employees uh, in order to avoid um, paying the costs of providing them with employment protections guaranteed under Minnesota law. And we're seeking a court order requiring SHIP to classify its workers in, as employees when those workers are in fact employees. Uh, and uh, these workers, if we win, will recover back in overtime wages owed to them. Uh, and we also filed a re recently filed a lawsuit against a construction company called PMC and its owner for obstructing an ongoing wage and hour investigation into the company by the Department of Labor and Industry, we allege that PMC not only failed to keep all the records required by law and refused to give those records to the Department of Labor and Industry, but that it actively dissuaded workers from cooperating with the investigation using threats and intimidation to chill cooperation at multiple work sites, including the Viking Lates project in Egan. Last, I think I said last thing, but I got one more thing, sorry about that. I would say that uh, we, I want you to know about this because this is important. I know all of you get calls for consumers for, and you do constituent services. Uh, I'm a former legislator and I know all about constituent services. Uh, please consider the Attorney General an option for you. Um, the fact is our Consumer Action Division uh, are a group of uh, folks who work at our office who field calls from Minnesotans. Uh, last year they fielded about 52,000 calls from the public. They mediated about 14,000 consumer complaints. Not every call is, is a complaint. Sometimes we give people information as to what to do next. But if we did mediate 14,000 consumer complaints and we arrived at settlements that valued more than $10.4 million that are going straight back to consumers. Now that's, that's helping households keep the money that they've already earned. And on the last four years, we've gotten more than $26 million um, <clears throat> uh, back for consumers. Um, so uh, we do this not by filing lawsuits, but simply through mediation, getting the consumer and the company on the phone, talking about the problem, uh, which results in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the outcome that I just shared with you. So um, we do have a list of... Uh, Priorities that we think are important, we'll share those with you. I won't take up time with the committee. Uh, but I think that uh, that is a, a overview of the work that we're doing. I'll tell you, Mr. Chairman, that I, I used to be in the U.S. Congress and I left because I didn't feel that I, I was doing enough to help consumers afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the Attorney General's office, every single day we're putting money back into the pockets of Minnesotans who work hard to get that money. Uh, and uh, that is extremely rewarding work. So I do thank you again for your uh, invitation here today and look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Attorney General Allison. I appreciate you coming to introduce yourself and share your work with the committee. Um, thank you for your good work on behalf of Minnesotans. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Attorney General. I particularly appreciate the good work of yourself and your office when it comes to mobile home communities and student loans. Um, my question uh, having to do with constituent services uh, would be this. I have a lot of folks reaching out to me with concerns or questions as it relates to the prospect of the legalization of marijuana and the licensing of its distribution. Uh, it seems to be a bill that's moving fairly speedily. So I'm just wondering, is your office in consultation with those that are, are considering its implementation and uh, are you looking to, to safeguard Minnesotans as the state uh, considers this legalization. Thank you. Attorney General Allison. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, we do get questions about the issue of cannabis all the time. We tell them that 
you know, the policy is up to the state legislature and we're watching it. There was some developments uh, last legislative session, as I'm sure you're very well aware. But usually what we talk to these folks about is uh, claims uh, of like CBD oil and other stuff where people will say, well, this thing will make you grow hair, make your breath smell better and make you two inches taller. You know, these kind of unfounded claims. And we uh, sometimes have to, you know, tell, we, we, we let folks know what the, what, the, what the consumer laws require in terms of disclosure and honesty. Uh, and uh, while I'll say that uh, some folks in that field tell the truth, others exaggerate. And so we've made a few calls. Uh, but let me tell you, whatever you pass, we will enforce uh, and we'll make sure that the actors in the, in the industry uh, are honest with consumers. Attorney General, uh, there aren't any further questions. I'm really grateful to you for coming before the committee. Thank you for your good work. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. And, Members, uh, there are no further have a great day. items on the agenda, and we are adjourned. <laughs>